All right. Thank you, Anne, for that introduction. Um, and thank you, everybody, for coming on this Earth Day to um, see this presentation. Um, as Anne said, I've got a lot of experience, not just in um, private practice, where I see it um, on a daily basis, um, but also <clears throat> yes, slide. Um, with my own cockatoo, Peaches. Um, that is me. I was about 14 or 15 years old, and I was taking him into um, elementary, middle schools um, to uh, inform people about uh, parrot ownership. Um, and he actually passed away a few weeks ago um, at the age of 28. Um, so we had a long uh, time together. Um, he started mutilating when I went to college. Um, I believe that was the, the trigger for him. Um, and that was when he was about five years old. So he mutilated over 20 years. Um, so I, I've dealt with this for decades and, and I share the frustration that many of you all share um, and many of the questions and, and guilt and shame and, and, and different things that, that go along with, with seeing an animal um, um, chew on parts of itself. Um, so that, that's a little bit of my background, and you'll see peaches throughout this presentation. So um, it's self-destructive behavior is not unique to birds. Um, in humans, it's called trichotillomania, um, trico meaning hair. It's an impulse control disorder, an OCD disorder in humans um, related to anxiety. And it doesn't have to be pulling out the hair. It can just be twirling it, chewing it. Um, we see a lot of that happening in adolescence. Um, girls, for instance, like to twirl and chew um, their hair. There's other disorders that humans um, have that uh, are probably maybe more common. The people that you know pick at their, their thumbs and um, uh, cutting, things like that. So it's, it's not uncommon. Um, we also see this uh, hair um, destructive behaviors in non-human primates, mice, guinea pigs, rabbits, sheep, muskox, dogs, cats in artificial environments. And that seems to be the key there is artificial environments, um, you know, with knowing that dogs and cats don't really have a, a natural environment because they're a created species. But for the others, um, it seems to only occur um, when they're outside of, of their, their native habitat. And that seems to be similar for um, our parrots too. We don't really see um, a lot of feather destructive behavior in, in wild birds outside. In birds, the term is called pterotillomania, so taro meaning feathers. So just some examples of other species um, uh, for dogs that a lot of them will get these acrolic dermatitis or granulomas. Um, I've experienced this with my own dog. Um, he was owned by an elderly lady, couldn't take him outside and walk him. He became obese um, and all he did would, would be lick his paw and he had lesions similar to the ones in that picture. Um, you know, she took him to the vet um, long story short, um, she couldn't fix it, um, but I got him, you know, did have to use an e-collar for a period of time until he stopped doing it, started walking him, getting him out, getting him active, and he doesn't do that anymore, so that behavior went away. Um, we see it a lot in cats, um, like this obese cat over on the right side. A lot of them like to um, what's called psychogenic alopecia, um, where they continuously lick at themselves, probably from boredom, lack of exercise. Um, and then we see it in mice in laboratories, um, probably due to stress or other factors. Um, they are also known to do it. Non-human primates. Um, I do see some primates in practice, and I see this an awful lot, um, especially in the single housed primates, um, where they just constantly itch at themselves, and, and they itch and itch, and it's like called what's called a stereotypy, um, where they constantly do it, and it removes the, the fur, and, and it's probably greatly related to boredom. Um, sugar gliders, um, that picture on the right, um, he's wearing a collar. Um, they are notorious mutilators, especially when they're kept by themselves. 
Um, so if they go through a surgery, um, things like that, they can mutilate themselves. The, the males um, are notorious to um, chew on their own penis, um, especially when they're by themselves. Um, so it's, uh, it's self-destructive behaviors are seen throughout the animal kingdom um, and mostly related to captivity. Back to our bird, though, the prevalence is, it's hard to figure out a prevalence because a lot of um, birds don't come into veterinarians. Um, the ones that do, you know, are, you know, are, are specific category. Um, but of the ones that do, um, prevalences that are reported are approximately 10 to 15 percent of captive citizen birds. That's the whole gamut of birds of citizens um, that chew, bite, pluck, or pull their feathers. In grays and cockatoos, that's even higher, around 40%. Um, I would say most of the grays and cockatoos that I see in practice um, chew on their own feathers. Um, and oftentimes the owners have no idea because it can be very subtle. Um, the birds can hide it especially if they've been yelled at before for, for chewing on their feathers. Um, they learn to hide it so that they don't get yelled at. Um, or on the other side of the coin, they might do it more um, so that they get attention and do get yelled at. So um, that's one of the, the big things is you have to hold your, hold your uh, temper. Um, yelling at them is not the way to get them to quit doing this behavior. It is one of the most common and most frustrating conditions to deal with in captive parrots. Um, this African gray here, you can definitely see how it's chewed um, at all of its flight feathers. Um, this one down here is a little more subtle. Um, you can just see where it's chewing a little bit on these contour feathers under the wing. Um, another little uh, evidence here is where it's chewed this uh, rachis, um, chewed about half that feather off, but it's very subtle how you can see that it's removed some of these little things called barbs from the feathers under the wing. So most owners aren't gonna, gonna notice that. So going into the types of damage, there's many types of damage. Um, one of the more common ones before you see uh, further feather destructive behaviors is over preening and they have this unkempt appearance. So birds in the wild that you see outside your window, all the feathers look perfect. They look great. Um, for a bird that's over preening, like this cockatoo on the right here, the feathers just look disheveled. They, they kind of have this an unkempt appearance to them. And so that's a bird that's going to spend more of its time preening than it would um, in the wild. Plucking is intentional pulling of a feather. A lot of people I see confuse this with normal preening. Um, as they're preening, feathers will come out that are meant to come out. Plucking is when they grab onto that feather and they pull it out. And um, you'll see some uh, later pictures that le usually leaves this little hole, this follicle um, that shows that they're that it's that it's plucked out. Barbering is when they're chewing parts of the feather. So this macaw down on the lower right is also a more subtle version. And you can see from the feather anatomy, um, our barbs are these on these uh, the sides of the feathers, and then the rachis is that uh, spine down the middle. Um, this bird was just pulling off some of the barbs, so um, pretty mild, um, hard to notice, and it was covered by these contour feathers, so the owners had no idea. Um, but you can see where they, they've got these jagged areas here, which is evidence of uh, barbering. Um, some birds will rub, so they'll scrape feathers using their feet um, or other objects like this Goffin's cockatoo on the left. So this bird doesn't have a mate um, and it will use its feet and it will use toys to rub those head feathers off. Um, this, uh, this picture was from a few days ago and the, the, uh, the parents had gone on vacation. And when they came back, um, he had um, reorganized his head feathers. Um, and then we get to mutilation, which is kind of in a category all to itself. Um, it's trauma to the skin and the muscle. And so what I tell people when their bird is destroying feathers is, you know, it's not the end of the world. 
Um, it's, you know, it's very common. It does show us that something isn't right. Um, something isn't, you know, something needs to be changed or, or, or altered. Um, but mutilation is, is more serious and that they can develop, you know, infections. Um, some of them will chew through their, their body wall. So that's much more serious. Other destructive behavior is, you know, as I mentioned in the earlier slides, um, it's, it's common, um, very common and, and, and human do, humans do similar um, activities too. So that it, feather destructive behavior is not the end of the world. Um, mutilation isn't either, but it's a much more serious category. So our African gray parrots, um, they are very commonly um, destroying their feathers. Um, a lot of them look like the one on the left. Um, but it can be very different like the one on the right where it just kind of chewed on the, the right side of its body. And you can see little, little areas here um, from where it pulled the feathers out. So that's not a natural molt. Um, there's even a little bit of blood here from where it pulled that out. Cockatoos, um, these guys are 13 times higher than other species. And these guys are also um, chronic mutilators as uh, peaches was, um, but they, it's very interesting, the patterns that you'll see. Um, this bird, for instance, it did chew off several of the reiki um, from these, this, this wing, and it's removing most of the barbs from certain areas. Um, so they, they have these different patterns and I think it goes to their incredible intelligence. Um, why they choose to, to do these patterns, I'm not sure, they're all different. This bird also chews over its wing web or its patagium. Um, that's another popular spot to remove feathers. Um, the unfortunate thing is with birds like this is they really can't fly at all. So flight training for them um, can be very difficult. Um, and then this other cockatoo is kind of chewing to its down feathers. And a lot of cockatoos will leave some of those down feathers for whatever reason. <clears throat> Macaws, um, another big uh, feather destructive behavior bird. Um, the one on the right is really serious. It's chewing all of its rakei, um, removing barbs, um, chewed to the skin um, under the patagium, along the, the wings, along the chest. Um, similar uh, here, we're kind of just choosing parts of our chest. And then this is a chronic long-term um, hyacinth tour. I see a lot of um, parrotlets um, that also chew on their feathers. Um, I'm not sure why that is. Um, same with the eclectus. Um, a lot of them will, are also feather destructive behaviors. I will say that I do see from time to time um, and a unique molt in eclectus parrots where they kind of are missing um, feathers on their head. That seems to be where they start out their molt. Um, so don't confuse that with feather destructive behavior um, or beacon feather disease. Um, I'm not sure why this species does that, um, but, uh, but I do see that. The least likely birds, um, but not to say they don't do it, because I've seen all three of these species do it too, um, are budgerigars, cockatiels, and amazons. Um, to see a lot of Senegals, a lot of Quakers, a lot of lovebirds, um, a lot of conures, including green-cheeked conures. But honestly, anything with feathers can chew at those feathers um, for medical or behavioral reasons. Um, going to the mutilation syndromes, I do see um, occasionally an African gray that mutilates. It seems like they um, pick one of the areas like either the, um, the wing web or the leg web um, or under the neck. So not exactly sure why they do that. It can be very frustrating to treat. And cockatoos, these are our notorious mutilators. Um, Moluccans are very high at, at mutilating umbrellas as well, um, and it seems like they usually choose the area over the chest, um, kind of, sorry, um, kind of right here over the chest. This is a deep one over the chest. This bird shoot over its back, um, and I'll um, go, go over what we think may be causing some of these um, in just a minute.
Tail mutilation. Um, this is uh, not too common, but it almost always relates to a prior injury. So this is actually Peach's um, here, and he would chew around these feather follicles, um, and he would chew, chew around a couple feather follicles. Um, I did remove those feather follicles, um, and he just went to different uh, areas of the tail. Um, same with this Moluccan here. Um, there's this wound here over the over the tail. And these seem to almost always be related to trauma. Um, this is a pic, uh, radiograph of peaches. Um, so this is a normal cockatoo down here. It's an umbrella, but similar to a Moluccan. And you can see how the spine just goes nice. The spinal cord goes through here. Um, we've got nice spaces between the vertebrae. This was peaches. So his kind of went up and down, the, the bones are kind of sitting on top of each other and more than likely pinching the spinal cord. Um, this is his pygostyle. Um, it's kind of twisted over to the left. So I believe what happened with him is um, one day when he was wearing his collar, um, he fell. Um, and I think that may have, have damaged the tail. Um, so for all of these cases that I have seen, um, uh, tail amputation seems to be the, the best thing to do. Um, this is shortly after it was amputated. Um, this is after it's grown back, um, him and his outdoor aviary. Um, and as you can see down here, it, it didn't really um, bother him at all um, since he wasn't, it, it may have, he, he could still fly. Um, he was never great at flying. Unfortunately, I trimmed his wings way too young, so he never got comfortable with flight. Um, but uh, the tail amputation seems to be the, the, the cure for, for mutilating of the tail. So um, when working up these cases, your veterinarian will want to look for medical causes first. Um, medical causes because they can be fixed. Um, it's really hard to treat behavior. Um, so the first is to try to find a medical cause, um, and we always start with nutrition. So many of these birds are on poor diets. Um, in practice, I'm seeing most of these parrots live into their 20s and 30s. I'm not seeing very many in their 40s, and very rarely see one in their 50s. Most of these birds are living a quarter, a third of their lifespan that we know that they can live, and a big portion of that is diet. I think another big portion is lack of flight. Um, so um, dietary imbalances that I see with a lot of seed mixes. Um, this bag on the right says vitamin fortified parrot food. Um, so they put vitamins on top of it. Um, as you all know, our parrots take the holes off of those seeds. And so there goes your vitamin fortification. So you're just, you're paying more for, um, for something that doesn't work. Um, uh, I see a lot of hypocalcemia and I see this a lot in birds that are fed only uh, fruits and vegetables as well. It's really hard to balance um, a diet, which is why we recommend a pelleted diet. Um, hypovitaminosis A is huge with seed diet. Seeds are deficient in vitamin A. In the wild, um, we don't really know everything that birds eat. We don't even know what our domestic, well, you know, not domestic, but we don't even know what the wolves in this country eat and they're not able to fly. So we know what birds eat at certain times of the year, certain trees that they go to. We know they do eat a lot of seeds, a lot, of, a huge variety of seeds um, that are very different from the seeds that we raise in captivity. They eat a lot of the fruits that are very different from the fruits that we've designed for our children to eat in captivity. They eat flowers, leaves, bark, insect larvae. So this is a chart from the American Zoological Association um, about fruits, um, comparing wild and domesticated fruit. And I want you to pay attention to the wild figs that they would eat in the wild. Um, if we came across these, we would find them uh, very unpalatable. Um, but this is the fruit that they would eat in the wild. Pay attention to the sugar category first. So wild figs have about seven and a half grams of sugar. We have nothing. Even our vegetables are two, three, four times as high in sugar. 
Um, but look at our fruits, look at the fruits that we've domesticated and that we've raised um, to make, to be sugary and watery. Um, and cantaloupe has 11 times as much sugar as wild figs, grapes, um, 12 times as much oranges. Um, the closest fruit that there is to the wild figs are domestic figs, and there's still twice as much sugar. So the takeaway from this chart is probably vegetables are more in line with the fruit that they would eat in the wild, even though they're still very different. Take a look at the calcium. So wild figs have about 0.83 grams of calcium. Nothing comes close to that level of calcium in our fruits and vegetables. That's why it's so hard for people that do only a chopped diet um, to be able to, I see a lot of birds on chopped diets that um, have low calcium, low blood calcium. Um, it's very hard to formulate your own diet which is why pellets are so much more useful. And then finally, I want you to look at the fiber. So wild figs have about 49, 34 grams of fiber. Um, nothing comes close in any of our uh, fruits and vegetables. Wild figs are higher in fat um, than any of our, our fruits and vegetables. Um, but remember, these birds are flying miles and miles a day. Um, so they're working off that fat. Um, here's a comparison of seeds and nuts. Um, fat flower seeds is 38% um, fat. We go all the way up to macadamia nuts that are 76% fat. Um, sunflower seeds are more than half fat. Peanuts are about half fat. Um, so um, uh, a lot of fat in, in uh, seeds and nuts. Um, pellet brands. So this is the, the mainstay that, that I recommend and that we recommend. Um, a lot of nutrition in birds, like I said, we don't know everything that they eat in the wild. So a lot of this is based off of um, poultry nutrition, um, but right now it's the best we've got. Um, I see a lot fewer issues in, in animals that are fed pellets, and I see them living longer lifespan um, than birds that are on seeds. So these are the pellet brands that have a lot of data behind them. Um, Harrison's, um, make sure you do the Lifetime um, brand. The high potency that you see in the middle down here um, is much higher in fat, and that's to convert them initially to a pelleted diet. Um, I do see elevated liver values in birds that are kept on this diet um, for their lifetime. So it's not something that I recommend long term, um, but I, it would be fine to transition them to. Lefebvre's, Rowdy Bush, Supreme, KT, Missouri, Pretty Bird. Um, I do not have a problem with artificial colors or flavors. Um, I know a lot of people do. If you do, um, that's fine, but maybe get your birds started on pellets by eating them, um, and then you can switch them to a more organic or natural pellet if that's uh, what you want to do. Um, so these are my dietary recommendations. I recommend about 60 to 70 percent pellets or a whole seed formulated diet like Lefebvre NutriBerries. Um, these are different than seeds because they are shelled and they're uh, fortified with vitamins. So um, unlike the fortified diet you saw earlier, they're not going to shell these off and, and lose the nutrition. Um, 20 to 30 percent veggies, greens, and chop and then five to 10% seeds, nuts, and treats. Now, eclectus are different, and we're not really sure why that is, um, but we do know that eclectus parrots that are fed a solely pelleted diet, we see um, some issues with that. We can see toe tapping, um, other neurological issues. So for eclectus, I still recommend a base of pellets or nutriberries, about half, but then about half veggies, greens, um, and then maybe a little bit of seeds, nuts, and treats. Um, and I've got that little um, opinion thing down there because you're gonna find opinions on this all over the board, um, uh, but be careful um, with what you read online. I know a lot of people, a lot of my clients are feeding um, tops and other alfalfa-based pelleted diets. Um, I have seen diarrhea in some birds from that diet. I think the alfalfa might be too rich um, for some birds. 
um, you know, and, and birds aren't herbivores, they're frugivores. Um, so I guess if your bird is okay on it and is doing well, it's probably fine. Um, just make sure to diversify it. Obesity, um, quite common in, in parrots, becoming more and more common. It's hard to determine um, without feeling a bird, although some of them you can. And I'm in Tennessee, so I call this the Dolly Parton. But you can see on these birds here, you can see this crease down the middle, that's the keel bone. And then we've got fat on both sides. So both of these birds were very obese. Um, the cockatiel actually had um, fat feet as well. So again, I usually see this on birds on um, seeds, although I will say Amazons, um, some budgies, um, some cockatiels um, can get fat on pellets too. Um, but usually if they're on a pelleted diet, I don't see that as much. Um, cancer, so I see a lot of xanthomas, which is, um, it's usually got this yellow appearance on the wings um, and there's feather loss and they'll pick the feathers from it. That's what this is here. Um, that's what these are here. They're a real pain to deal with, but often these cockatiels primarily, if you get them over to a pellet to diet, these will get smaller and sometimes shrink away, similar to lipomas. Um, so these are fatty tumors. Um, this mealy Amazon was much fatter than it should have been. And you can see some of the tumors down below, um, but the, it had these big tumors. This one's kind of over the vent. Um, it was on a seed peanut diet, um, difficult getting feces out. It lost weight and the lipomas decreased in size. I see a lot of lipomas in Amazon parrots. Um, a more worrisome cancerous um, lesion is squamous cell carcinoma. Um, so birds will often pick around that as well. Um, I'll also see a lot of um, uh, feather destructive behaviors around the preen gland or the uropygial gland. So the one in the center that's circled is a normal preen gland. Um, these are the feathers that are called the uropygial wick. Um, so that's the preen gland produces these oils. Not all birds have them. Amazons don't. Um, Hyacinth macaws, some of, the, some of those birds don't. Um, but most of the others do. And it's a bilobed organ that produces these um, oils that we think um, help to waterproof the feathers, help to um, their antibacterial, antifungal. Um, so I do see a lot of birds that pick around this area and you can see this one's lost its wick. Um, it's also became lumpy, bumpy. Same with this one. These are new feathers growing in because it's been picking the feathers out around it. So it's becoming inflamed. Um, it's irritating the bird. And so they're picking the feathers around it. Usually for these, I'll just remove that gland. Um, the birds do quite fine. Like I said, Amazons don't even have them and somehow they're still able to, to, to waterproof and, and do quite fine. Um, wing trimming. So I'll get up on my soapbox here. Um, wing trimming is crippling the bird. So it cripples them. It causes them to become unable to walk or move normally. Um, I think this is probably one of the worst things that we can do to birds. Um, I made this mistake, as I mentioned a little earlier with my own uh, bird peaches. Um, I hand fed him, which was probably another mistake. Um, he started flying around the house, you know, uh, pissing off my parents. So it was time to, to trim his wings, I thought. Unfortunately, I should have let him continue to fly because it, they, the behaviors think if they haven't learned well how to fly by about seven, nine years of age, that they'll never choose that as their um, as the reason to uh, primary means of, of motoration. Um, I don't think motoration is a word, but you, you understand what I mean. Um, so it should be used temporarily if possible. If, you know, if you're, you've just got the bird, you're wanting to work with the bird and train the bird, then that's a good reason. Otherwise, we should really be altering, altering our houses um, to make it more for them than changing our birds to make them more for us. Um, you can see these terrible pictures down below. Uh, this was a parrotlet that um, a lady decided to trim wings on herself, and she literally trimmed into the wing. 
Um, so the bird uh, became flightless um, for sure. Um, and we had to patch it up and repair the, the, the wing damage. Um, another poor wing trim here. Um, I can only imagine what it feels like to these birds to have you know, all of those secondaries gone and some of the primary feathers gone. Um, so it, it can do a lot of damage to birds. And I'll see a lot of birds that have had a bad wing trim or had an initial wing trim. And then I'll see that they have started barbering their feathers. So it seems to lead to feather destructive behavior as well. Um, <clears throat> so th that, that's, that's one of the biggest issues I have with with um, avian medicine today, you know, like I said, I see primates in captivity, and and um, I used to think they were worse off than birds, um, but at least we don't cripple them. You know, I don't know what uh, what would be similar, maybe tying their legs together, um, but I do feel more for the birds um, because of taking away their ability to fly. Um, Thitacine beak and feather disease. This is a serious disease. Um, a circovirus um, that can cause feather loss, especially if you notice feather loss on the head. Um, this is um, what you'll see if you've got a feather picker. Um, so this bird does have feather, um, beak and feather disease, um, but it also had a mate that, that kind of chewed the feathers off. Um, Conspecific, so other birds in the cage, um, that uh, pull feathers out. Um, it can look like beacon feather disease, um, but again, you can see where the follicles are, where the feathers have been pulled off. And some birds do it from aggression. Some birds do it because they really like the other bird and, and they think it makes them look pretty or I'm not sure why exactly. Skin infections can occur, um, bacterial, fungal, like aspergillus is possible. Heavy metal toxicity, a lot of times people have no idea where the source of the lead or zinc was. Um, this was off of a playpen. Um, we scraped off the paint, sent that out, and it was uh, positive for lead. Um, zinc is in, in many of our um, toys. Um, so zinc will usually pass through okay if they don't have a big source of it. Um, lead is usually more serious. Parasites, I don't see these, but it's mentioned in the literature that um, Giardia can cause cockatiels to pick. And then um, Nemetocoptes, I, I do see this in, in captivity occasionally, but this is the one mite. Um, people come into me all the time with check for mites and I never find mites. Um, it's very unusual for parrots or inside birds to get mites unless there's like a, a nest of robins beside the window that's kept open and they crawl in the birds. However, these nematocoptes, you can see them on um, canaries, on budgies. Um, that is a mite that you'll see, but you can tell, you know, you can see the crusting of the skin, these little honeycomb things where the mites burrow. So don't waste your mite, uh, money on the mite protectors. Um, they almost never get mites. Um, allergies, so so many of these birds come in and they smell like smoke. Um, so, um, I, I, and a lot of the owners upon questioning, um, they smoke outside, they smoke in a bathroom or, or, or whatever, but the bird still smells like smoke. Um, remember the canaries in the coal mine, you know, the canary, if it falls off its perch, um, the coal miner will grab the canary and run the heck out of there because they are so much more sensitive to odors than we are. Um, I've had birds die from Febreze plug-ins, um, scented candles. Um, the big thing is, of course, nonstick cookware, which is also dangerous to us. Um, but especially if, if it gets burned, it'll take out your whole, um, your whole, uh, your whole flock of birds. So be very careful with anything that smells. Um, the contact allergens, you know, or is there a, something that you washed um, at the, their, you know, blank, a blanket with and they rubbed on the blanket and it's um, irritating to them because of laundry detergent, um, things like that. Skin irritation, I mentioned smoke dry skin or low humidity. Um, some of these birds are from very high humid areas. Um, so they appreciate a humidifier. Not all of them like um, being squirted with a water bottle. You can try a fine mister. Um, you can, some birds only like 
natural rain, and you'll see that in a minute. Um, we do know that intradermal skin testing is considered unreliable in birds, unlike um, humans and I think dogs and cats. Systemic illnesses, liver, kidney, pancreas, all those diseases um, can cause feather destructive behavior, cardiovascular disease, atherosclerosis. I'm seeing this in almost every bird that I take x-rays on that's in their 20s and 30s. Um, hardening of the arteries, usually from a, um, a high fat um, peanut or seed diet. There is a whole smorgasbord of other things that can cause a parrot to pull its feathers out or mutilate. Um, I won't go through all of these, but pretty much anything that can happen can cause them to, to rip at their feathers. Uh, one of the big ones is reproductive disease and hormonal changes. Um, I don't have the time today to go into re reduction of hormones, but if your bird um, has high hormones, um, it's a good idea to, to try to tamp down on that, limit the amount of food they have, um, only 24 hours of food at a time. If there's a surplus of food, they're going to think they can make a surplus of babies. There's all sorts of orthopedic disorders. Um, the photo period can differ, um, especially if a bird that's further away from the equator is going to respond to that more to daylight changes. So try to keep their daylight at the same time. Um, trauma is the bird in the picture that scraped its head. Um, viruses, bornavirus um, that was kind of discovered around 2008 is becoming more and more um, common in birds. We think about 40% or so of birds have the disease and they don't show symptoms. Um, some birds it may cause to pick their feathers. Um, the jury's kind of still out. We kind of have um, differing opinions on that. And many are multifactorial. <clears throat> So as I mentioned with the mutilators earlier, um, and probably feather destructive behavior as well, um, Scott Eccles with the Comprehensive Anatomy Research Project, when he started doing micro CT scans on these birds, he was noticing that with birds that don't fly, they have a reduced density in their thoracic girdle. Their thoracic girdle is all of the flight stuff. So the wings, the spine, the coracoids and clavicles, all of that um, is responsible for flight and the spine here. And there is reduced bone density. So the, the bone density is, is much decreased in these birds, like here on the, um, the, the uh, coracoids and the clavicles, you can barely see them in these, in these birds that don't fly. And his theory is that the nerves are deformed where they exit laterally, um, where they exit to the sides, um, and that creates neuropathic pain. And that's his thought about why um, they chew here or they chew here um, is because they've got pain and probably from lack of flight. So your vet will want to do a medical workup um, and you know, they're going to take a good history. They're probably going to want to do blood work and radiographs. Anything else is probably de what de dependent on what they find when they're examining the bird. So you can test for heavy metals. You can do skin and feather biopsies. You can test for specific diseases like bornavirus, the, the hot one of the moment, um, skin scraping and cultures. Um, uh, checking those out. The important thing is to have a good avian veterinarian. Um, so if you can find one that's boarded with the American Board of Veterinary Practitioners, um, or, or especially at least one that's a member of the Association of Avian Veterinarians, um, don't just take them anywhere. And it's very difficult, I know these days, um, finding an avian vet that's located nearby. Um, but it's probably um, um, worth it. You might have another vet that's you know, available closer for emergencies, but I would try to find someone that's interested in, in birds and studies birds to, to you know, be your, your go-to for important stuff. Um, there's a whole range of different medications depending on what um, the bird is dealing with. Um, with Bornavirus, um, we see Onsior and Celebrex seem to help a lot um, with those symptoms. Um, and Medicam to a, to a certain extent as well. Um, for birds with arthritic changes that maybe have poor bone density, um, gabapentin and tramadol are good pain relievers. 
hormone therapy, these, this, these are band-aids. Um, so these are also really expensive. Um, it's not something you want to have to do all the time, um, but it might help you get you through a period or if your bird's chronic egg layer um, or you buy you time while you're training the bird. Um, that's what you reserve these hormone therapies for, but they're, they're quite expensive. Behavioral medic medications. So don't hesitate to, to try some of these. Um, we're bringing birds into our world. Um, our world has a lot of people that are on these medications. So if our humans are on these medications, why would we expect that birds that we're taking from the wild and putting into our homes um, could not also benefit from these medications? And um, the, the trouble is a lot of these haven't been tested on, on birds. Um, we've only used a few of them in birds and there's countless others that would be wonderful to see if it made a difference in birds' lives. Um, I have used um, all of these to um, differing success rates. Um, so it depends on what's going on with your bird. I had some cockatoos that both started um, plucking um, because of a stressful event. Um, diazepam worked really well and they were able to come off of it and, um, and didn't continue their feather destructive behavior. Um, Howdall is for mutilators. Um, it was the one medication that seemed to successfully work on peaches to where he didn't have to wear a collar. So, um, you know, you train your bird with any of the medications to, to accept food from a spoon or syringe, and, and that's, you know, a discussion for another topic as well. Um, but put it in the applesauce, the fruit juice, the peanut butter, nut butters, whatever, um, and see if it makes a difference. Um, Howdall is used widely in, um, in mutilating cockatoos. There's an injectable as well. It's given every two to three weeks um, or an oral that's given um, once to twice a day. They use it extensively in nursing homes too. That way they don't have to restrain the patients. Um, they call it vitamin H in the nursing homes um, because it calms them down. It, it avoids the, the night frights and things like that, that that go on there. So it does have its uses. Um, the one caveat is, you know, you have to go slowly in your dosing um, because it can turn them into a zombie. And you don't really want a zombie bird. You kind of want a, you know, a, a bird with just the edge taken off. Um, but this was the, the medication I had the most success with in peaches where I didn't have to use a collar. Other medical treatments depend on the diagnosis. Um, for most of these are for mutilators, low level laser therapy. Um, the downsides is you need to be close because it's usually twice a week. Um, supplements, topicals, water-based, need to be water-based um, or else it will uh, affect the feathers. Um, it, they're generally considered ineffective for feather destructive behavior. I don't know why Pluck No More is still on the market. Um, maybe it's helped a few birds, but generally I hear um, and it seemed to help for a few weeks and then, you know, now he's plucking again. So um, I'm not sure that, that you're not going to find a magic fix. Um, for, for feather destructive behavior. For wounds, I've had um, good luck with calendula echinacea hypericum cream, um, silver sulfadiazine cream, um, supplements like CBD and THC, we still don't have a good handle on, but are probably going to be beneficial in the future. Um, and then I wonder about things like psilocybin and ketamine. You know, we're just getting into those therapies for humans. They seem to be making a big difference for humans. Um, hopefully one day they'll make a big difference for our birds too, um, especially maybe a, a ketamine cream that you could rub into an area, um, things like that. So this is for mutilators only, um, feather protectors and collars. Um, otherwise, you're just going to... Um, uh, make your bird's anxiety worse. If your bird's just pulling its feathers and you put a collar on it, it's a band-aid again. It's just going to keep them from plucking their feathers for a little while and you take it off and they're going to be even more nervous than before. Um, but for mutilators, they can be quite help helpful and they come in a, a wide range these days. So 
Um, the, the ones on the right are things that I found useful for peaches. Unfortunately, most of the time I did have to use the, the big foam collar or else he would still get around it. Um, but I did have luck with this little thing here that, that was homemade um, and sometimes these smaller collars, but foam, insula foam insulation pool noodle collars are sometimes the most effective for, for mutilators. The plastic e collars can be useful too. Um, these are more temporary. Um, you can have it facing down or facing up like this bird. Um, these are very effective collars. Um, they have this clear um, flange here and then they have this um, collar of material. Um, these are very frightening to the birds, I think because of the reflection um, and then they hit the cage bars. I um, refused to, to, to use this on peaches after I um, tried it um, for a few weeks. It was very effective, um, but it was so terrifying to him. I thought, you know, I would rather um, just not have him in the world if, 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 um, if that's what it's what's going to happen. Um, but it may be for temporary methods, you know, that might be okay. The thing with collars is they need to be removed at least monthly. Um, you know, these birds have long necks. Um, you ne they need to be able to stretch. They need to be able to preen, um, watch their, and I would probably do that with the veterinarian. Um, that was probably the hardest part about peaches with the collars is, you know, when I would change the collars, um, you know, he'd lose trust in me for a day or two and he'd get over it. He was still seem quite happy, um, but it did affect our relationship and probably more me, um, but I'm sure he didn't enjoy it either. The important thing is to monitor the preen gland. If they can't get back there to, you know, to, to mess with it, to, to squeeze it out, um, then it can become impacted. You can have, also have ingrown feathers from where the collar is against the body. Um, the feathers can grow down into the skin. So some things to watch out for. And for some of these mutilators, um, euthanasia is a question. You know, I, I'd be lying if I said I hadn't thought about euthanasia with peaches many times over the decades. You know, it's, you know, would a bird want to live in a collar for its entire life? Um, and, and I wasn't ever sure, but, you know, I would um, look at peaches and he didn't seem to care, you know, the, the next day or within a few hours, he was up dancing and acting a fool. And, and so, I, you know, I could never ever euthanize him, but I, I had thought about it. You know, it takes, it takes a lot out of you emotionally, especially with cockatoos that are so emotional, but it's an individual decision. Um, look at the health status of the bird, both physical and mental. Um, it's a lifetime and longer commitment. Um, maybe you just need to accept the bird and accept the feather destructive behavior or accept the mutilation and realize, you know, the world is not perfect. There is suffering in the world. It's a part of life. So, you know, this is momentary suffering, but look at the big picture. He's still enjoying life. Um, he still wants to be here. So are there more good days than bad days? Then, then let's, let's keep going. So if we rule out the medical stuff, we're left with behavioral. And there's a lot of things that we do to birds these days um, that uh, we're learning we probably shouldn't be doing. So um, a big one is poor socialization. So we'll take these birds away from their parents at a young age and then we'll hand feed them, um, spend a whole lot of time with them, more than the parents spend with them, take them away from their conspecifics or their clutch mates, and then raise them alone. And I did that with peaches. Um, so it makes really sweet birds, really amazingly sweet birds, but they don't think that they're birds or they don't think that we're people. And this is called imprinting. And for those birds, I don't know that they'll ever be able um, to be like a wild bird. I think they're always going to be dependent on us. You know, for over 20 years, I tried to give peaches um, back a wild bird's life. Um, and I don't think um, I was able to do that because he had been imprinted. You know, he didn't realize that he was a bird, um, uh, that he could do things on his own. So we do a lot of, of, of bad things for these birds. Um, 
we also isolate them. So we'll spend, you know, oodles of time with them while we're hand feeding them. And once they're weaned, they go into a cage, um, you know, by themselves often. Um, so they, they're isolated. Um, if you notice your bird plucks more when you're leaving, we're, we're probably dealing with some isolation or some separation anxiety, or if they, you find a pile of feathers on the ground when you come back from a trip. Again, probably separation anxiety and isolation. For these birds, we're also, per, we're not letting them forage. Some birds will spend 70% of their waking hours looking for food. And we put this energy dense diet right in front of them on the perch. And all they have to do is move their head up and down and they're perch potatoes. Um, so, you know, think about that. So move the food bowl around in the cage, move the water bowl around in the cage, make them go climb to the top of the cage or outside the cage to get their food item. This works great if they're a pellet dunker because then they have to get even more exercise. Um, acute stress. So um, some birds, if they have seen stress and there's this um, widely reported story, um, I heard at the um, Avian Exotics Con years ago about um, this family came home and their gray had started plucking and they had a camera on it and they looked at the camera and it was, there was a bird feeder outside of the bird's window. And, you know, you know, it's nice to get to see other birds. The problem with bird feeders is that's the best way to attract a hawk. Um, so this bird had witnessed a hawk attacking this small bird, um, eating it um, and flying off. And so that was a acute stress um, for that bird. So make sure there's, there's places that the birds can hide behind in their cage if they don't want to see out the window that they can get behind, if they don't wanna see us that they can get behind. Um, so a line of sight to the window or door, long, short day length, and I mentioned this earlier with hormones. If you notice your bird is plucking um, here over the, the, uh, the, the keel area, um, she might be trying to set up for nesting. Um, Chronic stress um, is more seen in uh, wild caught birds. So in the wild, um, what do birds do when they get frightened? They fly off. In captivity, we totally take away that ability. So they just have to sit there and be nervous um, and anxious. So wild caught birds will often go through chronic stress. And some studies find that wild caught birds brought into captivity actually pluck more than um, hand fed birds. So this is probably related to a lack of choices, you know, a lack of flight to get away, um, a lack of foraging, a lack of bathing. Um, birds need choices. Which leads us to behavioral modification. Um, behaviors are excellent. Um, they're kind of like the psychologists of the bird world. Um, these are two that I've dealt with personally, so I, I know them well, and that's why I'm, um, I'm putting them up here. But there, there's lots of good bird behaviorists, and I'm sure Anne has um, tons of resources on other ones. Um, but they need jobs to do. They need um, training. And it's not as hard as you would think it would be. Even simple training, even um, cheap bird tricks. Um, uh, but figure out, so um, for a behavior, this ABC list um, you'll see talked about a lot with behaviors. Um, we'll go through that with any type of behavior. Um, but for instance, you know, the antecedent is what happens before the behavior. The behavior is obviously what the bird does. And then the consequence is what happens afterwards. So keep a journal of these behaviors and it, it's a good starting point to figure out maybe some things that can change um, so that you can change for the bird. Um, and I, I'm going to go over it looks like, but I get so excited talking about this stuff. Um, so enrichment, foraging. Um, this was an incredible study that came out 2008. Um, simply amazing. So we talked about teratillomania, that's feather destructive behavior, foraging enrichment. This guy took these PVC pipes, just a simple piece of PVC, um, and I believe he had two. He had one he hung by the chain and he put holes in it. So they, the bird had to rotate 
it to get the pellets out. So it had to work for its food. They trained them how to do this. Um, the amazing thing was that all the birds had a reduction in their feather destructive behavior. Just by putting their food into a feeder where they had to work for it, um, they all had a reduction of feather destructive behavior. But the more amazing thing is he put the bowls back in at the end of the study. The birds avoided the bowls and went down to the feeder that showed that they wanted to work for their food. It's called contra free loading. Um, they know that they need to do it. Um, so that's what they're going to prefer to do. Um, you do have to teach them how to um, forage for their food. Um, babies spend lots of time watching their parents before they figure this out. And each bird is going to be an individual. Each bird is going to learn at its own pace. Um, and you have to start slow. And then you have to move according to the bird's pace. Um, uh, I had an Amazon that had never been taught to forage. It took me a year and a half, two years to get her to, to where she would actually do um, some of the things I'm going to show you. Um, if you'll Google captive foraging, watch the video. It's a wonderful video, again, by Scott Eccles. Um, he shows you how to kind of go through simple steps of getting your bird to forage. Some of the other ideas for foraging from a recent study uh, that really help your bird, um, you know, and you might want to incorporate all of these. Spacing out food items. Um, having complex foods in different sizes and textures. Um, don't peel or crack or shell the food for the bird. Make them do that. Um, the larger pellets cause them to forage more. So buy the next bird size up once they're on a pelleted diet. Hiding food or treats in paper and cardboard. Um, this is really cool. Um, you can take these uh, muffin uh, papers and wad them up. And you can take um, masking tape. It's all very safe. Um, and then you've the sticky side up. You can stick them on there. You can put a sunflower seed or a special treat in some of them and then disperse them throughout. For the bird, initially, you're going, you're going to want to put a sunflower seed quite visible right there. You're going to make it really easy for them to start out, and then you're not going to show them. They're going to have to dig for them. Other ideas, um, wrap them in paper, stick it down in some tubes, um, or, um, wrap it with masking tape. Masking tape will be your best friend. What I like to do for mine um, is the, the ink is soy based. Don't worry about the ink, the colored ink. Um, I like to take magazine sheets put pellets in them, wad them up into a ball, and then stick it in there. And then stick non-food items like pine cones in there with it, so they have to dig through that. Um, as kind of a toy, you can drill holes um, through pine two by fours. Um, you can stick nuts in with nut butter and encourage them to start chewing at wood. Um, another great idea is I mentioned mixing food and non-food items, so they have to go through them. Some people like to use large rocks, large marbles, nothing that they can, can you know, swallow. Um, commercial foraging toys and puzzles, these are excellent as well. Um, I hear a lot of people say that you know, they just don't seem interested in them, and that, and they don't. You know, they get bored of these things. Um, so, you know, it might be a good idea for the main diet or for treats, so they continue to use them. But you're going to have to use different things, um, not just one foraging feeder that they get tired of. These are birds; they're so intelligent. Um, they're going to get bored of it in a day. Um, this is Phoenix Landing's HelpingParrots.com website. It has a lot of these toys on it. Chris Porter's Parrot Enrichment Activity Books are back online at parrotenrichment.com. Um, she has tons of ideas of things that you can do um, to make your bird work for its food and treats. I like to have a perch in every room so the bird can follow you around. Um, you know, you're its flock. Um, so, you know, it's good to have a, 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 um, a perch or play stand that they can come to, um, especially so they're not on you all the time. Uh, that will, you know, that can increase the hormones of, of some of our, our species, especially in when the daylight's changing. So sometimes some of these birds, 
in hormones is a different lecture, but some of these birds, you know, um, can't have human interaction for a while, but they can still be around you. Lots of toys. Um, one study said that, you know, for some of these feather destructive birds, they might need their toys changed out a couple times a day. So you need lots of different toys, lots of different textures. Um, which takes us to our single housed birds. So um, very different here on the left from here on the right. So, um, you know, Congo African greys can come together in these huge flocks. They'll forage on the ground, um, in incredible. Um, a lot of times our birds are kept alone. Um, that always made me feel guilty. You know, it, it gave me a lot of stress. Um, so I've, I do not like having birds by themselves. Um, I, you know, we can be the flock, but we do not make a good flock. Um, in this flock here on the right, um, they do not abandon each other for hours at a time. You know, they don't go on vacations. Um, vacation was, was mentioned in another article about um, birds with feather destructive behavior. Um, families that take more than one vacation a year um, seem to be correlated with more cockatoos damaging their, their feathers. So um, I've always been an advocate for more than one bird. And this paper mentioned that pair house birds, they use enrichment devices more often. They spend less time screaming. They spend less time preening. They're more active and it was protective against development of stereotypic behaviors and neophobia. So um, stereotypic behaviors, um, sometimes I'll see a lot of macaws that pace back and forth. That's a stereotypic behavior. Neophobia is afraid of new things. So which takes us to uh, a lot of birds are afraid of the outdoors. You know, they've never been out there, but there are ways that you can generally gradually desensitize them to be able to go to outdoors. Um, being outdoors is the only way that they're going to get the wind, um, the rain, um, the sunlight. You know, UVB is, is an important thing to us and to them. Um, and it's filtered out by glass and plastic. So these birds really do need to get outdoors. Um, there are, you know, uh, affordable aviary options. You can usually use like a, a kennel um, designed for dogs. Um, just put chain link fencing over the top like I did with one of my initial ones um, up here. Peaches loved bamboo um, so he could chew to his heart's content and he could hide from anything that that a hawk circling above. You know, I did have a, a sun protector over the top. Um, but they need, still need to be able to get out of sight. It needs to be safe, you know, um, depending on where you're at in the country and the predators. Um, these are sitting ducks, um, excuse the pun. Um, anything wants to eat them, so they have to be protected, and you probably need to have um, wiring on the bottom as well. Hopefully this video will play. Um, so um, Sophie, the Amazon on the left, does not like showers. She does not like bathing. She does not like me doing anything to her. But in a rainstorm, she absolutely loves to take a shower. Um, so flapping, hopping, climbing, um, you know, get what you can to make these birds active. Not all birds are going to fly. So can you get, um, you know, some... Uh, some hammocks um, so that they can climb around on it? Can you um, hide treats all around the room so that they have to walk around? Um, get creative. Um, a little more birds than I would recommend for this size of an aviary, um, but just to, to show you, you know, how different it is for birds in a flock. Um, so I, I do recommend flock. I do recommend flight. Most of us in, in, in the country and in probably in the world are probably going to need also an indoor aviary, um, depending on where you're at um, in the country or in the world, um, especially if it's a permanent thing. Um, but even if you can't do that, I do think it's important to take them out for a few hours a day, even in a travel cage. Um, I'm really impressed with Project Perry, and if I had to redesign an aviary, I would probably do this. They have a year-round aviary where they use 
um, the, the plastic sheeting similar to like in a greenhouse um, so that they can keep them um, outdoors year round. Um, so check out their, their website for some ideas. And that's all I've got. I'm hoping um, you've learned something or thought about something that you can do um, to improve your bird's life. Um, and I guess I'll open it up to any questions. Thank you, thank you. It's always uh, packed full of information as usual. And, I'm, and we have a lot of questions uh, in a diverse set of topics. So um, I, I was curious, you know, you're familiar with Dr. Eccles' work and you mentioned, you know, one of his uh, CT scans. Do you think that there's um, enough body of evidence at this point to say that mutilation is medical, more medical related and feather picking, maybe more diet enrichment or do we, do we know? Do you have I'm not idea? sure. I, I think there's so many different options, you know, like was, was it, because peaches was lacking flight, you know, it seems like with a lot of the cockatoos that are mutilating, it seems like there was a, an incident that happened, you know, I went to college and, and so did it just happen at the same time? I, I'm not sure. I, I think there's still so much that we don't know, but, but it nutritional is probably number one for feather destructive behavior. I agree. We see a lot of birds turn around when we get, we get them on a, a better diet. I remember uh, we had a special uh, event with Dr. Marshall from Australia to talk about eclectus specifically because that's always been a species with some heavy dis feather destructive tendencies. And he talked about how their digestive system was just completely different from other parrots and how it's hard for them to digest certain foods. And that in turn leads to that inflammation. So, um, that was very interesting to me because I'm sure you see a lot of eclectus. Have you ever seen, how, of all the eclectus you see, how many are feather destructive at this point, right? Yeah, a lot. More male than female or is it, about the, or is it all of them? Um, I'm not sure, not sure. Yeah, it's a kind of a mix for us too. Yeah. Um, you mentioned CEH cream, which is basically, if I recall correctly, calendula, echinacea, and hypericum, which are three mm -hmm. of my favorite herbals. Um, do you recommend a certain source for that? Yeah, and I put it, um, the only place I've been able to find it um, is with Quintessence Health in Madison, Wisconsin. They have really odd hours. Um, but I do have their phone number listed there. Um, yeah, that's very, that's good to know. Thank you. I will uh, make sure people get that if they didn't get it today. Um, do you recommend that for mutilation only or just for anything that looks inflamed? Um, I would say anything that looks inflamed, you know, if you have redness or swelling um, but especially those, those mutilating birds, mm -hmm. those wounds. And if you have a mutilator, and of course there's the expensive diagnostics, but is a, a CT scan is really the way to go to try to get a deeper idea, right? If you can. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. And, you know, Scott Eccles, if he were here would say they're not created equally. Um, you really need the micro CT scan. Right. Um, but you can probably get a glimmer of a glance, of, you know, a guess work even out of the, the dog and cat ones. Yeah. Yeah. X-rays just don't show enough detail sometimes. I know he was, uh, I don't think he's ready to publish yet, but he was definitely on the path to seeing a lot of bone density issues and heart disease with mutilation, especially with the Moluccans. So they seem to have a higher propensity of mutilation at least of all the mutilator, mutilators that have come into our system, it seems like it's uh, mostly cockatoos and mostly Moluccans for whatever reason. I, yeah. I don't know why. Do you know why? I don't. I've, I've got many, many theories. You know, maybe the ones that we were able to get out of the wild and breed maybe had a propensity for, for mutilating. Um, but I think whoever figures that one out will. Yeah be great. Yeah. 
Yeah, it would be in high demand. Well, thank you for sharing your very personal story and journey today, because I know a lot of people, like you say, a lot of people are take it, take guilt, et cetera, when it's just, we don't know. We don't know. We, we try hard, but we don't have all the answers, right? So no, um, I have a lot of guilt and shame, um, you know, but, you know, I, I like to try to beat up my 14 year old self but I didn't know what I was doing. You know, I didn't know, and it's still a lot of people don't know, uh, you know, that you shouldn't right. feed them by themselves. And, and so, you know, we can't have that guilt um, trimming their wings um, because we're here because we're trying to make a difference now. And so, you know, shame and guilt isn't going to help in anything. No. And things have changed so much. I know the people who uh, come to us for adoption if they've had birds a really long time, we find that they often are the ones that need more information than the newer people because they've been brought up in the time when feeding peanuts and clipping wings and you know one dowel perch and all those kind of old school things right. are normal for them. And uh, I'm glad to see things changing that hand feeding is going out of fashion finally and wing clipping is you know, considered I, almost I've taboo. Heard. I've heard there's a resurgence with the pandemic of people selling unweaned birds. Um, so hopefully we're not going backwards in, in that regard. Um, but we just got to keep educating and, and doing our best. Right. I was glad to see your focus on diet. That's a, a huge issue to me personally and to our organization. And somebody asked one of my favorite questions, which is about eggs. I know I always uh, bring that up in different conferences because I know there's a difference of opinion and we do feed eggs in very in moderation here. But uh, do you have an opinion about animal protein? Um, I, of course, I've got opinions about everything. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so some parrot species, we, you know, we do know that they eat protein in the wild, animal protein, bugs, um, cockatoos, you know, some of them love mealworms. So I think that's probably okay um, in moderation. You know, um, I think with heart disease and birds with atherosclerosis, I'll usually not recommend animal proteins. I especially do not recommend um, chicken wings. A lot of people like to give their birds the bones and because they just love the marrow, but you know, that marrow is going straight to their arteries. Um, mm. So that's one I'll usually say definitely no on, mm. um, but eggs in moderation, I think are probably okay. But, you know, as long as the, the person is realizing, you know, this bird is, you know, one fiftieth my size, so it doesn't need a similar portion. Right. That's true. Uh, somebody wanted to know if the non-steroids cause GI bleeds in birds. I guess um, maybe she has that experience in working with humans. Um, there was a report um, recently about GI bleeds and cockatiels on Celebrex. Um, so I, I haven't seen much of that myself. Um, but, you know, I, I try to treat it similar to I do myself with NSAIDs mm -hmm. with the minimal amount necessary to achieve the goal. Um, and if you're worried about GI bleeds, you can always, you know, use some sucralfate or some other medications to, to coat the GI tract. But I do not see very much of that. Oh, that's good news. Great. Um, you mentioned a medicine that helped two cockatoos who started barbering after a traumatic event and afterwards they stopped barbering. It wasn't gabapentin. Can you remember what it was? Yeah, that was diazepam. Um, value. Um, <clears throat> so, and, and in humans too, they like to use those medications short term um, because they're called anxiolytics, get rid of anxiety, um, but they can become very dependent on them. Um, do you have any opinion about mixing birds from different continents, you know, new world, old world? I mean, I think we all agree that it's so helpful for birds to not live alone or be tucked away in a bird room. But do you have, have, have you seen any difference psychologically or medically? I think they all speak different languages. 
Like I feel like even a, an umbrella cockatoo and a Moluccan cockatoo, they have different body languages, but mm -hmm. I think they might be closer than say, you know, an Amazon species and a African gray. So sometimes they get along fine, but I think they probably, you know, would prefer the same species. Yeah. And that's what I would prefer. Um, I don't know that I see many medical issues like I do with like tortoises from different continents. They'll, some will be okay with, with d different parasites. And then you put it with a different species and it causes all sorts of trouble. Um, so, you know, I think there, there is something to that. Um, but, you know, like I've got an Amazon and, and the cockatoo and, and so that, they, they, they seem to be okay together, but I think, you know, they don't read each other's body language as well. Mm -hmm. But and I of bet course, they macaws learn. are sensitive to macaw hypersensitivity syndrome with cockatoo dander. Cockatoos. Yeah. Yeah. So, and I, and I, for cockatoos, you know, I, I would, if you have a cockatoo, I would want a, an air purifier for any other bird, <laughs> even for the cockatoo. They're just so dusty and cockatoos. Right grays for your own health we get a lot of relinquishments because of lung issues from those species yeah um somebody had a cockatiel with a blood a giardia test that came back normal but was told that giardia can sometimes be a false negative we don't see much giardia anymore dr dahlhausen says he doesn't hardly ever sees it do you see it i do not know it used it's, to be a big thing, but I, yeah. we don't see it. Yeah. Yeah. It can be difficult to, to diagnose. I believe there is a PCR that might be available um, for it, but sometimes you just have to keep looking for it and hope that you see it in a, in a fecal sample. Mm -hmm. um, is CH, CEH cream good for foot irritations? Yes any kind of inflammation all three of those are anti-inflammatories and mm -hmm. all three of those are safe to consume you know you don't want to put a glob on their food and have them eat it every day but if they lick it or, or which they will um it's not going to be detrimental i use the hypericum sometimes as a homeopathic pellet um it's a really good it's a really good treatment um and the calendula and echinacea come in teas do you have any experience with teas? You know, teas, there's a feather picking tea, I think, that's got some of those ingredients. Any experience or thoughts on that? No, I, d I don't. Yeah, I think, I think um, it can't hurt, right? So, right. Yeah. Um, let's see. New and old world. Uh, is plucking wing flight feathers common? Yes, very common. Um, and I, you know, I might trace that back to, you know, the bone density from not flying. Mm -hmm. You know, os sense. osteoporosis, just like older white and Asian women, if they don't use their bones, it, it goes away. Um, similar with, with birds and their wings. And we see a lot of flight feathers. And especially when they've been trimmed, you know, like I mentioned, um, I'll, I'll notice especially a bad trim. Um, and, and I see it a lot, it seems like in um, green cheek conures where they'll start chewing that outer flight feather, those barbs off of the rachis. And it's very subtle and very small, but it looks like that's where it's getting started. Interesting. You mentioned that the, I, I know a lot of, at least some of the veterinarians who've been a long, around a long time, they're still doing those skin scrape cytologies or whatever. You mentioned those are probably not very helpful for the most part, right? Not generally. Maybe that McCall with that big skin infection mm -hmm. uh, just look terrible. Um, mm -hmm. That would be helpful for them. Um, I'm not seeing, I, I've never seen mites in a, in a parrot or, you know, mm. in, in the budgies, the nematocoptes where it changes their face and then chickens, I'll see mites, but just don't see mites either. So how, how often do you think there's like a bacterial infection of some kind internally or externally that might be causing that feather inflammation? Um, usually I'll cover birds that mutilate with antibiotics. 
Mm -hmm. um, but I don't think it's as common, you know, I, I think it's pretty visible. Like, you know, if there's a skin infection, it's going to look ir irritated, you know, mm -hmm. it's not just going to be um, normal looking skin or even it's dry. Like internal skin. bacterial internal infections. Can they I cause? I've seen a few of those. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Because it, I think it feels uncomfortable to the bird. Mm -hmm. Um, so, and you'll usually see other signs with that, like loose stools um, or something else going on, regurgitation. Um, regurgitation yeah. from a bacterial infection? Yeah, of the crop. Uh-huh, from a crop, like a yeast infection in the crop or something? Potentially, yeah. yeah. And some of those are connected with bornavirus. Right. Because um, it slows down the GI transit. That big, heavy topic. Coronavirus. Mm -hmm. Nobody panic out there. Uh, <laughs> no. <laughs> I do think we did a survey several years ago now and to find out if uh, to compare how many birds had uh, po tested positive on coronavirus and had feather destructive behavior. And there seemed to me to be a pretty strong correlation. I mean, it seems like coronavirus can be an inflammatory problem. Right? Yeah. It's kind of, you know, generalization. Got, yeah, you've, you know, a lot of uh, the Americans kind of think so. Some of the Europeans kind of push back against it, but opinions again, you know, what, yeah. works, what works for your bird, not for right. the literature. And, and I, I forgot to mention, but, you know, there's reports that, you know, some birds do better in smaller cages, some do better in larger cages. Um, so, you know, even our data is kind of all over the place. So you have to look at your individual bird. Would it prefer a smaller cage? Would it prefer a bigger cage? Um, you know, things like that. There, another study said that feather destructive behavior went way down with um, at least four hours of attention per day, you know, and that's a long time to, you know, spend with your bird training them and doing stuff like that. Um, so, you know, there's all sorts of data, some of it conflicts with each other, um, we're still learning a lot, but it's going to be, you know, keeping track of your bird, keeping a journal of your bird, um, knowing what helps and what doesn't. Right. And I see, you know, a lot of people will go get that larger cage, which we, for the most part, strongly recommend, but then they leave it empty instead of packing it full of things to hide behind and move around on and right storage etc yeah. so bigger cage but more to do yeah if possible um, and the, the smaller cages was specifically for african grays which can be neophobic and anxious birds it was from yvonne van zeeland not too long ago i remember that i kind of yeah. had some well anyway we have a wild caught gray who just came a couple of weeks ago living in a 18 by 12 stainless cage for the last 30 years oh. and we just put her in a 40 by 40 cage with stuff to do and she is so happy so everywhere and her feathers are growing back right. so in short order it seemed to me enrichment activity better diet and just kind of a a reset you know so yeah. um if there is potential for a bacterial infection causing inflammation or feather destructive behavior is there a benefit to doing like apple cider vinegar on a regular basis you know every few weeks any um, thoughts on that i don't think that hurts sometimes i'll recommend that to clients especially if they're um, having odiferous or smelly feces because mm -hmm. um, it seems to help by changing the ph and by it seems to help more for um yeast um, so I, I do recommend that sometimes. Really? Uh, so apple cider vinegar helps a fungal infection, which is yeast, in mm -hmm. addition to a bacterial infection? Mm -hmm. I didn't realize that. Okay, that's great. It can't hurt to be preventative. You want to tell everybody what the ratio is? People like me don't measure, so I never... <laughs> I, I don't know off the top of my head. Okay. We can look it up if anybody um, wants to know. Yeah, I think it might be a half teaspoon per cup, but I don't, I don't, I can't remember off the That's top. That's about, of that. yeah, a cap full in a bigger bowl is kind of what I do. Yeah. Yeah. Just make sure your bird still drinks the water. Um, that right. It's, you know, if it's too potent, they're not going to, it might change them wanting to drink it. 
Um, somebody wanted to know about going on vacation boarding versus coming into the house. You know, parrots are super adaptable and resilient for the most part. So I think, like you said, it's know your bird, right? I mean, what causes stress and what doesn't? Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, if if you're if it's the only bird, you know, you might be better off boarding where there's more attention. If you have a flock or a couple birds, it might be better to have someone come in and take care of them. There's a, a great need for more bird sitters out there. We're always asked and have very few. Yeah, you know, we can recommend. There's just never enough. Right. Um, let's see. Um, somebody thinks it was mentioned that tops pellets can cause diarrhea. I'm not sure about that. I think that's an individual. I don't think that's a general. No, it's not general. I have seen a couple of birds that have developed diarrhea and then I, we switched them off that pellet and it was, um, and it resolved. Um, so, and I've talked to Susan about this, whether alfalfa based pellets are appropriate. And she said, probably not. Birds aren't herbivores, they're frugivores. Um, so I, you know, I still think there's some work to be done. But again, it's the individual bird. If the bird's doing okay on it, you know, mm -hmm. then it's probably okay. Um, but I have seen some some issues with it. Yes, uh, he's referring to Dr. Susan Ores, which many of you know we we often have join us and consider her very valuable. Um, mm. What do you think of Cosequin for pain relief? Um, I think that it's fine for, you know, it's, it's not something you're going to give and see a difference immediately, like an NSAID. Um, it's something that's more of like a nutraceutical that needs to build up. Um, interestingly, even in humans, about 50% of people say that, it, you know, the, those help with their arthritis and 50% say that it doesn't. So again, it's up to the birds, but for like chronic arthritis, um, I think it can be helpful, um, help reduce inflammation, but it's going to take some time. It's not going to be instantaneous. Um, right. So again, this might be where you take notes and, and see if you think it makes a difference after a few weeks. Since uh, some birds, lots of birds have heart disease and some of that results in feather destructive behavior. What is your favorite go-to medication for that? Or is that species specific or individual? Seems like we have a lot of birds on Pimabendon and in, in April. I can't even say them all. They're just on all kinds of things these days. Yeah. Um, the, the best nutraceutical is going to be, in my opinion, Vet Omega from the infamous yeah. Scott Echoes. Omega-3. Yeah. 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 That's going to help with kidneys, with liver, with skin, with, with everything. Um, it's similar like with red palm oil, if it's sustainably sourced, um, that can be a good source of omega fatty acids. Um, it's going to be individual for what type of heart disease, but the, the mainstay these days is isoxaprine um, for atherosclerosis, yeah. if that's what we're dealing with. Um, but you really need to have a workup, see what's going on with the heart. Um, isoxaprine has really changed a lot of birds' yeah. lives. Um, it opens right. those arteries back up um, and can, can help them live a lot longer. I will um, spell but, it here, but I can't type and talk but it's the I-O-X. So in case people aren't familiar with, that's all I know, the beginning, <laughs> Zoc Supreme, yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, is, it, is it easier on the liver and kidneys than some of the other ones? Yeah, I don't, I don't see many issues with it, many side effects. How about Medicam and AKA Meloxicam? Do you see that having a long-term effect on... I sure don't. Um, and they've done studies and they, they haven't really seen much kidney disease like we see in mammals. Um, so it seems to be a pretty safe medication long term. Um, their kidneys are, you know, very different than mammals. So um, they seem to be able to tolerate in quite a, a large dose, again, which is why you need a, um, a veterinarian that's at least with the Association of Avian Veterinarians. The doses from 10 years ago in meloxicam were so much lower. Um, they started doing studies and they realized this is probably doing nothing for the bird's pain. Right. So right. the doses went 
I think it was like 0.1, 0.2 MIGs per kg, and now it's 1.6 MIGs per kg. Mm -hmm. So it's Susan the often tons. says even higher. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, because they are birds and they process it so fast, basically, right? So right. They, they need a higher dosage to maintain viability, right? Mm -hmm. of every how, often, how often do you see laser treatment help? And when does that help? Does that help from trauma or other things? I mean, usually, usually more trauma and inflammation, um, like with um, mutilators, it can really speed up the, the healing process for mutilators. Um, whether it does anything for feather destructive birds that don't have any inflammation, I'm not sure. Um, I'm not sure it does much. So, it, it, you know, if you're out of ideas, it might be worth a try. But again, it's going to be at least a couple times a week you know, for several weeks. Right. Um, so, but I think it's worth a try. You know, they do use it a lot in humans, um, but it's from, you know, um, inflammation, underlying illnesses, things like that. It's great for uh, resolving wounds and mm -hmm. healing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Pain, very good pain. for pain. Right, right. Uh, Dr. Ness, who's one of our famous favorite, um, like for herbals and things, he recommends the a sissy loop, uh, which is like a electromagnetic. Mm -hmm. I've heard uh, of. Yeah. So uh, somebody want to know about flaxseed oil? Yes. It's okay, right? Do you have a preference, flaxseed versus flaxseed oil? I do not, um, and I don't know how to dose those exactly. You probably know more about that than I do. We use Vet Omega, but you know, not everybody can get it. You can order it online if anybody wants to know how to do that or where it is in your area. Just email us afterwards, and I'll help you find that. But it's a great plant-based omega three, yeah, concoction. Um, we use it every day here. For everybody regardless of their health status it's just a positive thing period mm -hmm. um with liver issues um do you think milk thistle is valuable oh tremendously um and remember again it's a band-aid so you know you use it while you're fixing what caused the liver issues in the first place so oftentimes mm -hmm. um with birds with uh with increased liver values i'll use it while they're switching over to a, a better diet and away from the high fat seeds things like that mm -hmm. um but oh, i don't some ahead. birds can be on it forever you know that have chronic liver issues um again it's a it's a band-aid so it's not treating anything it's just supporting the liver um but it's fine long term too right Turmeric and dandelion are also good, everybody. Mm -hmm. um, oh, I just forgot what I was going to ask you. Um, oh, Dr. Marshall, he talked about, um, it was about um, if, a, if, if a, a collectus, he's the one from Australia with a collectus, he said if they had already pulled out their feathers and it was skin, that the feathers might not grow back, but as long as there was like down and other feather growth there, that there was a good chance for the feathers to grow back with better enrichment, diet, space, behavior, et cetera. Does that, have you seen birds recover feather growth with improved lifestyles? Yeah, I have. And, and I've had owners report that as well. And it's, it's amazing. Sometimes they'll just tweak a little thing um, and the bird will suddenly allow its tail feathers to grow back in and, you know, mm. things like that. Yeah, I'm glad you brought that up. That's the other thing Scott Eccles uh, talks about amputating the tail when there's been trauma in that area and continued bacterial infections. Did I get that right? Yeah, I stole that from him. Um, ah. All of his cases of tail mutilation, he's treated with tail amputation and they've all resolved and he's he's tried like I tried with peaches but he's tried with numerous different therapies removing the, the follicles removing the just the pigastyle but um, you really have to take off the damaged 
you know, up to the damaged spinal cord, you know, because their spinal cord isn't like mammals. Theirs goes the whole length of their, their spine. Um, so if their tail's damaged, you, you really have to take it off. But they so, do quite fine with it. And if they've had tail trauma and, you know, it's, it's out of whack, does that mean the rest of the spine may have suffered something as well that's not remedial at that point? I don't think so. Um, I think it's, you know, because of the way their body is, they've got that sensacrum that's really sturdy back there at the legs and past that is your, is your tail. So it's pretty sturdy up to that point, but the tail kind of, you know, it can go mm -hmm. any which way. Um, so it seems like the tail damage seems to be confined to the tail. Especially if they didn't get to fledge naturally and then they took a fall is that the most common way they hurt their tails i think so especially birds with collars because they're uh, uneven um so if they fall they fall right on their tail and it causes damage to that spine mm -hmm. and and how often do you think feather destructive behavior is related to hormone issues which is like birds are so out of whack in captivity on the whole mating hormone issue quite a bit so, especially that patchiness over the over the belly um mm -hmm. like you're making the brood patch mm -hmm. um hormones definitely need to be um taken care of in those birds i remember uh, dr fern van sant from from california she was our speaker several times in like 2005 six seven and she wrote an article about thermoregulators and birds and their legs and under their wings and how if we amped up got them all amped up you know in a sexy way by the way we touch that their thermoregulators would overheat and then they would start to pluck on their legs and under their wings does that i haven't talked to her in a long time but does that theory sound like it has continued merit it, that's an interesting theory um, because, you know, that's how ducks can stand on frozen ponds and not freeze their feet. It, they have these amazing adaptations where they've got the, the veins and the arteries go together. And so their feet can be a totally different temperature than their core. Hmm. Um, so that's definitely an interesting thought. I hadn't thought about that before, but it may have merit. Yeah, because uh, especially those cockatoos who are like, touch me here, touch me there, and then they get mm -hmm. all revved up, and then they don't know what to do with all that heat and uh, excitement, right? right? So, yeah, it's a hard thing to, to ask somebody not to touch a bird when they're begging for it, and they're cuddly and adorable, right? But So, so many of my clients come in, and, and, the, and it's the cockatoo, and I've talked to them for years, not don't stroke them down the back if you want to stroke. And they're sitting there in front of you doing that, yes. right? <laughs> if you want to stroke something, get a cat. Otherwise, right. you know, stick to the head. Right. Um, some people say the feet, peaches I could do under the wings, but you know, the back is that's how the birds mate, you know, old right. world new world but the you know they would jump on the back or they'll hold their foot on the back and and so that's uh, a no-no area right we get explicit instructions from relinquishers sometimes make sure that they get you know touched in certain <laughs> places <laughs> oh my goodness um so if a bird does have a mutilation spot and of course finding a ct you know or affording one is always the question is that, what is the you know first stop remedy is there you recommend putting some kind of cream or something on that spot for mutilators mm -hmm. just to help it not get bigger yeah i think so um you know ceh cream silver sulfidizing cream um something like that um would be a, a good start um you know honey um you just don't want the the bird to like the honey and start to you mean to like manuka it. honey yeah uh -huh. um, but the 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 problem with mutilators is you almost always have to prevent them from getting you know making getting, it worse yeah from getting to the area and so that almost always involves a a collar or some kind of device to 
they, they are more humane these days. They've got the ponchos, they've got, you know, things that can help, but um, a lot of, especially the cockatoos, they, they figure those out real fast and they can find a new area to, to mm -hmm. chew on. What about those birds who pull a feather when it's probably still even a blood feather and get that kind of endorphin rush and go, ah, you know, what, what is that? Um, they like the response so they, it's like, um, humans that cut themselves, you know, it, mm. um, it gives them an endorphin rush and makes them feel better momentarily. Mm -hmm. Um, and it can become an addiction. Um, some of those birds will do okay with like, may help them to give them like an opioid, like naltrexone. Um, I tried that with peaches, didn't have much success. Um, but it's, it's a thought. You know, Phoenix used to do that like 20 plus years ago, and I had a holistic vet and she had me give him bovine colostrum and, you know, mm. it worked that he mm. doesn't do that anymore. Now he's not in perfect feather, but he doesn't pull them out and make that, doesn't that feel good or hurt sound, which is what, you know, used to happen a lot. Yeah. Yeah. Somebody was asking about what do we do when we see them pulling we don't yell at them of course but i just want to say as a behavior person please don't respond to it because you don't want to give it value you know? right yeah a lot of our parrots are looking for um responses um so the worst thing to do is to to scream at them and it's the hardest thing to do because yeah. you don't want to just watch them do it um but right. if you can you know try to get them to focus on something else gets you know foraging or enrichment or chewing on a toy um you know if you can find something that the bird might respond to like a um, a broom or a rope toy or you know that they can chew on and still get that satisfaction from um, that might be helpful to shredding paper you know i like the they don't really have phone books as much anymore but you can go to your local bookstore they usually have a a, a book bin and you can get the soft cover books and, and cut them on a bandsaw and hang them up at, on the top of the cage and they can shred those papers, um, but give them different things to chew on other than their feathers. But unfortunately, you just kind of have to ignore the, the, right. the pulling them out They're You know, I've seen birds that pull it out and then they look at you waiting for Yeah, that it's spring. clear at that point, right? Yeah. Uh, and then they do another one and they look at you for another yeah. scream and, you know, it's, it's hard. Yeah. So we have to teach them what to do and reward those and ignore the ones we don't. That's always hard when you're emotionally invested, right? So, right. but it only takes one time to respond for a bird to say, oh, maybe, maybe if I try again, let me pull five feathers this time. So okay. yeah, walk away. Yeah. <laughs> and it's just that, that one time, you know, if you do it that one time, it's right. really hard to to extinct make the behavior go that extinct after right. that. Right. Look at you speaking behavior language. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think I've covered most of the important questions here. I can't. Some of them are a little long for me to read. Uh, is there any other species that we didn't touch on? Lorikeets or other bird, other parrotlets. Mm, we talked a lot about grays and cockatoos because of course they're the the big big ones yeah anything with feathers um with feathers yeah i see amazons occasionally um if i see those less likely birds cockatiels um budgies uh, um then i really want to push for a medical workup because if they you know if it's you know less common in them there might be something more there then i might want to get the lead testing done and the zinc mm -hmm. testing and x-rays and blood work and things like that to, to to find the cause um but i have seen it in in pretty much everything yeah and some you know, how often do you see stress feathers the stress bars on birds is that still pretty common uh -huh. I see those more in baby birds that are, you know, weaning and people are hand feeding them. I do see mm. those in with the pandemic and more people selling unweaned babies. I have seen more of those. Mm -hmm. And what about if a bird has like you showed some pictures of where they had just 
really barbered up and down the shaft. Is there any value at that point to somehow medicating um, and uh, forcing a molt so that new feathers start to come in? Is that, um, I'm just I've thinking wrestled, out loud here. Yeah, I've wrestled with that idea in the past, you know, would it be worthwhile to, you know, anesthetize them, sedate them and, and pull out those primary flight feathers, let them grow back in and then train them to fly. Um, you know, that's done sometimes, you know, similar done with raptors with imping the feathers. Um, if they are damaged, they'll cut them off the shaft and glue new ones in so they can be wow. released. Um, so I've thought about that for, for, for parrots and it might have some value eventually. I just wonder, you know, some of them that, that have been imprinted and don't know how to fly, um, it might just be a waste of money and, and time. There's some medication, I don't remember what Dr. Orris recommended for uh, accelerating a molt, but I, I would think if they'd had all their flight feathers barbered like that, it might be too much, but it seems like if they had new feathers that maybe were not as traumatized somehow, maybe that would help prevent the inflammation. I don't know. Who knows, right? Yeah. Well, do you have any closing thoughts for us and things we should do and not do to make life right for our birds? Um, keep on researching, you know, um, hormones is a big thing. Goodbirdinc.com. Uh, Barbara Heidenreich has some really good thoughts on hormones mm -hmm. um, that can really help. Um, but uh, keep, keep trying and there's always something that we can do um, other than guilt and shame. Um, yeah, just keep and love keep, them anyway, regardless. Yeah, accept them as who they are. Right. Well, if you're an IAABC member, your uh, code word for the day is Earth Day, because today is Earth Day. And I want to remind everybody that uh, Dr. Bordeaux is from Knoxville area. And if you're in that area, he's a great avian vet. Go see him. And uh, next month is Adam Patterson, also from Knoxville, the Knoxville Zoo. Some of you are familiar with Einstein, the African Gray who uh, Adam and Einstein actually came to one of our retreats one year, and some of you got to meet Einstein, but Adam's a great trainer, and we're going to talk behavior on May 20th, so I hope you'll join us again for that. So thank you, Dr. Bordeaux. You are a wonderful resource, a fantastic avian vet, and don't burn out. We need you. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Thank everybody for attending. Great. Um, he said that we could record this and put it on our past event recording page. So we'll be doing that later. And thank you for allowing that. That's great. No worries. Okay. See everybody next month. Thanks for being learners. We love that. Bye.